Hey, it's great to be with you all again. I believe today is a special day. I believe that today the Lord wants to come into your home, into your lives, wherever you are, and He wants to impart a fresh infilling of His very presence, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, the fire of God. He wants to bring it into you today. And I tell you, that fire, that presence, that anointing is going to be what you need to face whatever you're facing this coming week. And the presence of God that comes into you is going to change not only who you are, but how you walk through what you're about to face this week. And Pastor Sean is going to talk to us about how Elijah uh, met with uh, all the false prophets and at, a, at a, a mountain in the Old Testament and how the fire God came and consumed. I won't, I won't uh, give a spoiler alert. Well, maybe I already did. But it's going to be, a, it's a great message. And I want us to be prepared going into worship. And, you know, there's a passage in that um, uh, 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 text that Pastor Sean's going to talk about that kind of stood out to me. And it said, where Elijah says, how long are you going to limp between two decisions? And it just stood out to me that that is what so trips you and I up all the time, right? We're kind of stuck between two decisions. And today, I believe there are some of you who are stuck with trying to decide which way do I go? What do I decide? How should I move forward in life? And I believe the Lord wants to give you wisdom to be to make the right decision. In the book of James, it says, let ask of God and he'll give you wisdom. Just don't be double-minded thinking, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't, maybe I heard, maybe I didn't. Be confident and bold that your God is coming to you. Now, I want us to jump in to worship. And I, I think about all the times where God came and consumed sacrifices. Do you remember Abraham? And he, God was making a sacrifice with him. And um, uh, he made a promise to him, rather. Sorry, God made a promise to Abraham. And in that promise, Abraham fell asleep. God said, I'm going to be a I'm going to make a covenant with you. I will be your God and you will be mine. And from you, there will be many, 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 many descendants. And um, Abraham fell asleep and God came and consumed the sacrifice that Abraham had prepared. And then there was the story of Moses who um, was in the tent of meeting and the glory of God came down in a fire and consumed the, the, uh, the offering and the fire of God was, was such that um, uh, the people around could see it. And then there was King David who in the very first um, uh, time when he created an offering to God, God came down in a fire and it says the priests couldn't even stand up to minister because the fire of God fell. And then you think of the disciples and how they were all in that upper room. They were God followers, just like Abraham, just like Moses, just like David. But this time, the fire of God didn't fall on a sacrifice they had prepared, but they themselves it is it says they were living sacrifices and the holy spirit came down on each and every one of them and it says that it 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 not it consumed their life it gave them the ability to to be bold and courageous as god followers it gave them the ability to do signs and wonders and wherever they went miracles were breaking out healings were breaking out there was wisdom that was that was gifted to them i tell you what my friends if ever there was a time where we need more of god it is today i would love to pray with you and invite you to jump into worship as we do this. So Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. 
And I, I feel a fire in my bones because I believe you want to come to us in the place of worship. You want to cross um, the, the digital divide. You want to cr- come to us through the airways, through the, through the internet. And I believe you're coming into people's homes. And as people are saying, yes, Lord, I need you. I need you to consume my life. I need to make a decision. I, I cannot no longer limp between whether I choose you or I choose something else. I choose you. For others of us who are God followers and Jesus followers, Lord, we're saying we need more of your spirit. So right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, come and consume us. The sacrifice of our worship, we give to you now. And we ask that you would fall upon it and fall upon us. Fill us with your very presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends, let's go to worship. And as the song is playing, I I encourage you to sing along with it. Um, If you want to type something in the the, uh, messaging going back and forth, say, yes, that's me. I want more of you, God, however you want to interact. But I can ask you, come, let's worship and let's see God and watch what he does as he consumes our life, as he fills us with his very presence. Let's go worship. Lord, let your glory fall as on that ancient day. Songs of See you are good, 
here to meet your maker, blacksmith. Right here, Tannen! I thought we could settle this like men! You thought wrong, dude! When I was a kid, my dad loved to take me to westerns. My dad was a western nut. In fact, he still is. But you know, the great thing about westerns is they're pretty predictable. And in every western, it always goes like this. I mean, the dog gets shot or the girl gets taken or the bank gets robbed and the good guy has to put up with the evil people in town and he gets so frustrated because they're just kind of taking over everything. And finally, he can't take it anymore. And so he risks his life. And every Western I've seen has the big showdown, right? Well, maybe almost every Western. The big showdown where he stands in the center of town and they shoot it out to see who's really going to be the ruler of the town. Well, I'll tell you, what we're talking about today in this Imagine More series is the biggest showdown in the entire Bible. And Elijah is at the center of this. Elijah's a prophet. He's a man who is bold and he stood up for God. And he would not compromise. He was a man of tenacious faith. And what we're about these next few weeks is teaching you to have a tenacious faith. And so there comes a time, you have to know, where you can't put up with the bullies. You have to say, I'm in, and you give your time, your energy, your resources, in fighting for what is right, and you will not compromise. And that's what today's lesson is all about. Let's look at it together. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 18, and it says this. After a long time in the third year. Now, the third year means that Elijah had gone to King Ahab because King Ahab was not doing good things. And he said, until you get your act together, King, you and your wife Jezebel, that really was his wife, until you get your act together, there's not going to be any rain for the next, until I say so. Until you repent and get back right with God. And so now we are three years into this drought. It's a pretty serious time. So you can imagine, I mean, it's like a dust bowl and there's probably death and dead animals and everything like that all around. And so, so you can imagine it's a pretty tense time. And so after a long time, the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. That's a big thing because Elijah had stayed clear of Ahab. Even though he didn't fear him, he knew that his life would be in danger if he was in front of him. And so God says, now's the time. Let's do this. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah said. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. See, he gets to the real issue right away. You see, Ahab wants to blame. He won't take responsibility for his actions, even after three years of facing the consequences for his sin. And you see two different perspectives. One person wants to blame everyone else for his problems. 
But Elijah calls it straight and true. He gets to the real issue. The reason this whole land is in a mess is because you're a mess. Because you have sinned, your whole family has sinned, and you have not repented. And so now we get to the showdown, where people have to take a stand for whose side they're on. I think it's a stand we still all have to take today, because this is what happens next. Elijah says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So 850 people were opposed to the one true God. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went for the people before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. So that's so key. In other words, Elijah's just constant straight. You have been wavering between two opinions. And, and I got to say, you know what? That's the question I have for you today. Are you wavering between following the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or are you serving other gods? See, Elijah called it. And this is the saddest part, right? Because he says this. And that's a pretty big thing to say to a group of people. And this is what it says. But the people said nothing. You see what happened there? They were passive. They didn't engage. They didn't take a risk. They didn't take a stand. You, you have to ask the question, is saying nothing actually saying something? It's interesting. As we look throughout the Bible, we see people who stood up for God and people who did just the opposite. That's even true today. And you have to decide, and this is why this, this message series is so important for us, because I want us to be people who stand up for God. I want us to be people of tenacious faith who will not quit, who will not give up, who will not cower in the showdown, but will stand strong and will win the day because they had the courage to take a stand for what was right. I think that's what God's saying to all of us today. In fact, I look in the book of Revelation and I hear these words. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, Jesus says to the church in Laodicea. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What's God saying here? I want you to be hot for me. I want, that sounds a little weird. I want you to be hot for God. I want you to be red hot. I want you to be on fire. I want you to be bold. I want you to be tenacious. I want you to be strong. I want you to be courageous. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be cold. You see, these people wouldn't take a stand. And so Elijah calls them out. And now he comes up with what I would say is a fiery plan. He says to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces because they made offerings in those days and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call the name of your God, I'll call him the name of the Lord. By the way, this is a pretty bold challenge. The God who answers by fire, he's God. And all the people said, what you say is good. In other words, hey, great idea. They are still playing it on the fence, right? And so I think for Ahab, even though he was opposed to the Lord, he thought, how can I lose? Baal is worshipped as the God of the uh, sun, the fire of the universe. Surely fire must be up Baal's sleeve. And so he puts all his cards, he stacks the deck, he puts it all in on Baal to win. But he doesn't know what he's up against. You see, I feel like right now, if we are to move forward as the people of God, if we are to see transformation in our community and in our lives and in our families, we can't be straddling the fence. You know, some people have one foot on the deck and other people have another foot on the boat. And what happens? You get wet. And when I look at this, I realize that a divided allegiance is as wrong as open idolatry. Now, you see, what's idolatry? It's excessive or blind adoration. It's following false idols. And we have to look at what are the false idols in our lives? What are the idols that cause us to compromise our faith in Christ? And so you have to ask yourself, what false god 
is the true God exposing so you will turn your heart back to the Lord. Because what happens next is Elisha says to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull he gave them and prepared it. Then they call on the name of Baal. This was a false god, right? Uh, from morning till noon, Baal answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. No one answered because Baal wasn't the true God. You see, it's easy to remain in a mediocre state of non-commitment. You cannot continue in this period of divided allegiance any longer. You can no longer afford to straddle the fence of indecision. You know, um, I know I was a youth pastor for many years, and we had this graduation banquet, and at, at every banquet we gave the seniors a gift that was kind of indicative of their time in high school, and, and we had all sorts of fun awards that kind of reflected who they are. And I had one guy, and he always straddled the fence, right? He was always trying to play both sides of every issue. He would never take a stand for God or for anything else. And so when his, came, his time came for his award, and I'm kind of embarrassed to even tell you this. I can't believe I did this, right? We got this little stuffed doll, and we took a picket, and we put the doll on top of the picket. And we said, this is what happens when you straddle the fence. You get pickets up your butt, okay? Now, this could get edited out, by the way. <laughs> But I know when we started our church, I told that story, and everyone else did what Jamie did, who's just watching me right now. They all gave this little wince, but then my friend Matt Sears came up with t-shirts for our entire leadership team, and he called it the picket removal team. And I thought, perfect, because you know what? You can't straddle the fence. We can't keep playing both sides. You have to take a stand, because if you don't take a stand, the church will not go forward. People will not come to know the true and living God. Those stakes are too high to risk being half-hearted. And so what we see here is that either you are for God or you are against him. Do you believe that? I kind of do. And so I love what Joshua said when he got to the end of his life. Joshua is another leader in the early church, or in the Old Testament, actually. And he said this to the people, his final speech before he died. He said, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Well, my friends, it's time to take a stand. You can't straddle the fence anymore. It's time to set your sights on what is true and what is good. It's time to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have a big dramatic showdown for you. I'm not going to light anything on fire here, thank goodness, right? But, but when I read this story, I think, man, this was gutsy. And that's the great thing I love about Elijah. You see, when we're sure that we're in the will of God, we are invincible and can stand fast. I mean, you see, Elijah never flinched. He never wavered or um, was intimidated because he didn't see this as 850 prophets of false gods against one. He saw it 850 false prophets against one plus Almighty God. You see, Elijah knew whose side he was on. And he listened to God. And, and I truly believe that he would not have made this challenge unless God had guided and directed him. And he was bold. There's no question. That's what tenacious faith is. You stand firm for the true God. And so when, when I look at this, um, it's interesting because uh, it says that as this all went on, right? It gets more and more chaos. It's more and more madness. It kind of gets bloody too. It says at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. I mean, now Elijah's just having fun. He says, shout louder. He said, surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. I mean, he's mocking this prophet Baal, this God Baal that these people worship, right? So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. And midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. You see, now Elijah is just, just having fun with this <laughs> in a different way. 
But then what happens next is even more amazing. Because you see, before we can defeat the enemy, we must just reestablish the Lord's place in our lives. And that's what Elijah did. He said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. You see, he reestablished the place of the Lord in the people's lives. He reestablished the Lord's priority in their lives. This is what we must do first. And so Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob to remember where they had come from, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. So right now he establishes the Lord's place in his life and where he feels the Lord's place should be in the people's lives. But then he doesn't just stop there. It says that with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. Most people think it was about like 24, 25 pounds. And he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood, and then he said to him, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time. Do it again, do it again. And he ordered, and they did it the third time. And the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. Now, most people say, well, where did he get the water? Because there was such a drought, three and a half years. But you see, they weren't that far from the ocean. So he got them to go to the ocean, and they had four big barrels of water. And just to make sure there was no tricks here, right? You know, because he said, the God who's in charge, the God who's real, is going to light this sacrifice on fire. And so he doused it with water. So it couldn't have been lit by any human. And so then, as he does that, then he says this most incredible prayer. You see, if you want to be an Elijah, you have to recognize that your most effective tool is the prayer of faith. Prayer shouldn't be our last resort. It should be our first stop. And I have to ask you, you know, when you're in a difficult situation, do you personally pray? Do you personally pray? Maybe now is the time. And it's so, it's such an incredible prayer because it says, at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward. By the way, he had to step forward. And so do we. And he prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you are Lord, that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the soil and also looked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. You better believe they cried that out. They saw who the true God was. There was no question. I mean, this was the best showdown ever. This should be in the who's who of great showdown events. And so what we see is that God had a desire for these people to turn their heart back to him. I mean, that was the goal. That was what that prayer was all about. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. What does that mean, to have your heart turned back again to the Lord? Sadly, I think many of us have turned away. Well, I don't know if we did it intentionally. Maybe we did. But I think for most of us, we get caught up in the worries of this world whether it's COVID or the political climate or fires or drought or the list goes on and on. And, and those things are real dangerous, right? But we get distracted, we turn away. And we're not looking to God for our solutions anymore. We're looking to people who can never fill God's role. And when I look at this and I see that this was the moment of proof Hebrews says, for our God is a consuming fire. You better believe he is. And when I look at this passage, the part that comes next is probably one of the hardest parts to hear. Because it says, then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. And they seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, and they were slaughtered there. And like, holy smokes, that was pretty harsh. But you see, from Elijah's perspective, Evil must be eradicated. 
Now, now that's pretty severe. Believe me, I'm not advocating going out and killing anyone, okay? That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about the fact that there is an evil that must be put to death. There is sin that must be confronted. And we have to make sure that if we are going to be people who are strong before the Lord, we have to deal with our sin. We have to deal with the evil that may be in our lives. You can't just kind of treat it halfway. I mean, this sounds like such a severe story. And it is, really. It's pretty extreme. But when you think about that, I, I know, you know, these past few um, recordings, you see me wearing a Band-Aid. Uh, I had cancer surgery, right? And they had to cut and tell everything, all the margins were clear. I have stitches underneath here. And by next week, hopefully it'll be off. And uh, in case you're wondering what this was, uh, I joked about it. I said, oh, Patty must have hit me or something. But then everyone said, oh, you deserved it. And I said, okay, that wasn't the truth. It's really, it's cancer. And, uh, and so the thing about it is, so can you imagine, what if they started and they said, well, we got, we got most of it, but you know what? We didn't want to deal with all of it. You know, we just, we, it was enough, right? Um, when you go to remove a cancer, you have to remove it all or it can come back. And see, so eradicating evil is not so much extreme as it is essential for survival, as it's wise. Now, obviously, this is an incredibly extreme example. And I don't think that that's what God is asking of us, just so you know. But I think what God is asking of us is that if we are to go forward without any hindrance, right? Jesus says it this way in Hebrews. He says, let us run the race with endurance and lay aside any sin that entangles us. Because sin slows us up. And I tell you, I want to be squeaky clean if I'm going to be able to accomplish what God wants for me to do, because anything else slows me down and slows God's kingdom down. And the same can be said for you. And so I, I want you to think about this. I don't want you to focus necessarily on the extreme situation we see here before us, but, but I, I do know this, is that, that I want to have a pure heart before God. And I believe you do too. I was looking at uh, Psalm 51. It was David's psalm after his sin with Bathsheba. And I read this in the message translation. It says, generous in love, God give grace, huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record, scrub away my guilt, soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been, my sins are staring me down. You're the one I violated, you've seen it all, seen the full extent of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step with you for a long time in the wrong since before I was born. When you're after, what you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me then, conceive a new true life. We have to ask, what sin is God desiring to eradicate from my life? I like the NIV translation of Psalm 51.10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Oh, my friends, this is not just something just to say, to give you a bunch of churchy words or to talk about um, sin like it's something far away that only evil, horrible murderers do. The Bible says all of sin and fall the short of the glory of God. And the wages, what we've earned for our sin is death. But God demonstrates his own love for us. Romans 5, 8 says that while we are yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. This is the greatest sacrifice of all. God took the punishment we deserved and he gave his life on the cross to pay the price for all we've done wrong. How could we not want to walk with as close with him as possible so that we might not be hindered by sin anymore? Let me just say this to you. If you're wrestling with something right now and, and you need help, call us. Let us pray for you. Let us talk with us. Send something uh, online to us you know, so we can, can just reach out to you. Let's, let's walk through this together. Because we're not here because we're perfect people either. We're sinners who have been saved by the grace of God. And we've made mistakes. I have. But the truth is, I'm so grateful there is a God who loves me and cares for me and wants me to be the best I can be. And so... He asked me to take care of my sin so I won't be hindered from making a difference for him. This is what I beg of you. And I see in this story that what happens next is that you can never underestimate the power of one totally dedicated life. 
You see, Elijah says to Ahab after they say, can you imagine Ahab probably standing there with his eyes, his eyes wide and his mouth wide open. And he just looks at Ahab. And I'm sure Ahab is taking it pretty seriously now. And Elijah says, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. It hasn't rained for three years, by the way. No one's seen a cloud in the sky. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing here, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Now, I don't know if the servant wasn't looking carefully or what, but he had to go back seven times. What if Elijah had stopped at six? Okay, that's enough. I guess I was wrong. No way. I said, you keep going back. It didn't happen the first time. There was no rain the second time. Nothing the third, fourth, the fifth time, or even the sixth time. But on the seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. That's how big this storm is going to be. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind rose. A heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elisha. That's pretty something. Huh? And tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. He was full of the power of God. So here's our big Imagine More question. Lord, where and how do you want me to take a stand for you? You see, we said that this message series is about having tenacious faith. Last time we talked about calling on the God of the impossible and trusting him to do things beyond our comprehension or our own abilities. Today, what I want to ask you is take a firm stand against the evil in this world. Take a firm stand for your Lord. Stand for him and do not compromise. Do not flinch. Do not back away. Stand strong in the showdown. Because I believe that when you do, when you lean into Jesus and he gives you that courage, you will see incredible things happen. And that's what this time is all about watching God do a revival in our own lives, the lives of our community, the lives of people in our church. This is what Tenacious Faith is all about. Amen. Amen. Great message, Pastor Sean. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week. We hope you have a great next week. I'm going to take a second to thank everybody that uh, continuously, consistently um, gives to Clayton Community Church. And we want to also have a special recognition for the people that committed two years ago to the Imagine More campaign. Um, thank you for your faithful giving towards that and um, those that are still finishing it up um, this last five weeks um, as we finish this phase of this um, um, campaign and we are very very thankful um, we know that it's been difficult this last couple years but many 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 of you have continued to support that commitment and we are thankful we're building a church building but more than that we're building a place um, to build God's kingdom so thank you for that have a great week and we hope to see you next time bye-bye